Hello, and welcome to our podcast, Vodcast. It's vodcast. A, is it, it's a vodcast. It's a vodcast. Okay. Welcome to our vodcast. Uh, I'm David Ludwig. I'm Emily Cooley. And we are uh, composers at the Curtis Institute of Music. And we're talking about music of the 20th century, modernism leading into the Darmstadt School of Modernist Composers, and then reactions to that, postmodernism, all these things that the school is exploring through performances uh, over these two mm -hmm. years. And specifically today, we're talking about a piece that was performed twice this year, John Cage's Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that piece? So 433, as it's commonly called, is one of Cage's, if not his most famous piece. And um, as many people probably know, it consists of the performers walking on stage, performer or performers, um, sitting down at their instruments and then not playing for four minutes and 33 seconds. So he doesn't specify what even the instrumentation no. is? He doesn't specify the instrumentation or the, I don't believe he specifies the type of performance space or anything like that. The piece really rests on this idea of just four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. And um, it was written in 1952 um, and in the decades since then, it's been written about and spoken about extensively, and it's raised all sorts of questions, such as what is music, what is sound, what qualifies as performance, what role does the audience have in the performance of a piece, et cetera, et cetera. And as Cage said, I have nothing to say, and I'm saying it. Right. Which I, it's a great, it's great, a great quote. quote. But uh, Jinx. But um, the, so what's the, what's the audience experience then of, of this piece, regardless of the ensemble? What, what's happening on the stage and, and what, 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 as an audience member, what's happening for you? Um, for, as the audience, you have to sit with that, I think for a lot of people, that discomfort of nothing happening. Mm -hmm. And probably there's some amount of coughing or fidgeting or whatever that happens. And, I think the audience really becomes a sort of living organism, a force in this piece as it's happening in a way that is not the case with other pieces. Yeah, there, actually, that's that's really true. There's almost a there's almost a participation by the yeah. audience in involuntary the participation. Involuntary, but, yeah. right? Um, which is funny. You know, in my first year music history class, talking about this piece, we had a singer and a pianist come on to play it. And you know they get into position, and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And the piece is divided into three movements, so right. it's very funny. And being funny is a big part of this—the mm -hmm. humor of it. The pianist will actually, you know, people will relax in between movements and cough, and you know, do what you do in between movements, right. even though it's just been silence, which is hilarious yeah. and funny and witty. But what we learn, and what a lot of people learn, and on the kind of baseline is that all sounds are music. In other words, you're sitting there in silence, but there's no actual silence possible in right. life. And Cage something, said something like, uh, there's been sound since I was born, and there'll be sound long after I die, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Yeah. So you're hearing the air conditioner, people coughing or giggling, you know, someone maybe opening a mint, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever the sounds yeah. are. And we learn that Cage is saying, look, this is all music, right. folks. This is." But it seems to me that there's a, there are multiple layers of this that are worth at least talking about. Sure. So what, what, would, what are some others that you would say? I mean, so the ones we've touched on are the humor, um, the humor element and then the, the philosophical element. And I think what I think about as a composer is the conceptual element. So this piece um, the, is entirely a concept. There's not really any execution of it except just the performer goes out there and right. sits. Um, and so, you know, everything that the piece is and everything it stands for rests on that concept. And conceptual music is something that is, has been used ever since then, and probably before too, um, in lots of different ways with, uh, with many levels of seriousness. And it's something that influences my music to some extent. How so? Um, I think concept, is a, is a force that drives my music, that drives my music partially, not entirely. I don't write pieces that are entirely conceptual. Like for example, I don't set out 
the parameters of what's going to happen before I start writing and then write every note according to what I had planned to write. Mm -hmm. But there's some element of that that goes into what I compose, whether it's deciding on particular harmonies to always use or rhythmic patterns or a form or what have you. But because for Cage, this piece is the complete abandonment of control right. and ego. When we talk about a composer's will or ego being exerted on music and how Cage was interested in taking the ego out of it, that there's a, a Buddhist sentiment there that, yeah. that he's pursuing. Um, by creating that space where you know, there's silence and the audience is participating, the composer has almost no control over what's going to happen. Right. Even the duration is malleable. Right. Um, and I, I think so this, that sense of time progressing mm -hmm. and that feeling of, of, the, of space and time and the elasticity of it yeah. that's so particular to music, mm -hmm. I think is one thing he's exploring. Yeah. I think he is being irreverent and uh, subversive looking at the, the idea of performance itself, that we all kind of trickle onto the stage, mm -hmm. take our bows, play our music, trickle off, clap, clap, clap. Right. He's almost destroying that formula. Yeah, well, it's a parody in a way. It is a parody, yeah, that exactly. sort of ceremony. Exactly. Yeah. And then I think on another level that all sounds have an inherent beauty or richness yeah. in them, that all sounds are valuable and mm. worth considering. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's even a crossover with electronic music there, the way an electronic music composer is building sound really from the ground up. Yeah, um, and, and, li and And needs to listen so intently. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, maybe in the end it's about listening and being a listener yeah. that he's really exploring. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. Well, it's, it's a piece that has echoed, you know, in the 50, 60 years mm -hmm. since it's written over composers' work and the way we think about art ever since. And it's great to have an opportunity to talk about it. Yeah.